So the gender pay gap is the key indicator that we have for assessing women's equality in the labour market. And that's when we compare women's average hourly earnings with men's average hourly earnings. And in Scotland, the pay gap just now is 15%, which means that for every pound that a man earns on average per hour, a woman earns just 85 pence. And if we compare full-time average hourly earnings with, uh, between men and women, that reduces slightly to 12%. But when we compare women's part-time hourly earnings on average with men's average full-time hourly earnings, the gap leaps to 34%, which itself is illustrative of the concentration of part-time work in low-paid jobs and sectors. The pay gap is about more than just pay discrimination though and is caused by a multitude of different factors. Women have a very different experience of the labour market to men. Gender norms and stereotyping about women and men's capabilities and preferences results in women being concentrated into low paid, undervalued jobs and sectors um, and men being concentrated into traditionally male dominated sectors and jobs. So women are more likely to be found in caring work, cooking, cleaning, admin and retail. Uh, and these types of jobs are obviously also uh, largely part-time. And men are more likely to be found in technical and manual occupations, engineering, construction, science. Women still do the majority of unpaid caring in the home and coupled with a uh, lack of flexible working in many workplaces results in them having to seek um, opportunities and jobs uh, and the only part-time work was available which tends to be in the female dominated sectors that are the low paid and undervalued in terms of their skills. That lack of flexible working and untransparent and biased recruitment and progression practices also contributes to women's underrepresentation in senior levels, which is more commonly known as the glass ceiling. There is widespread discrimination in pay systems across the labour market, and although this is usually not intentional, and instead it's based on the design of the pay and grading systems, whereby there are particular value judgments based on gendered assumptions about how we reward particular jobs and particular skills and who it is that does those jobs, men or women. So occupational segregation where men and women do different types of work is a common pattern across every sector in the labour market. Men are concentrated, some, these are some of the most starkly um, segregated industries with men dominating in energy, manufacturing, construction. Whereas women are more likely to be found in the public sector where they make up two thirds of workers. Generally, the pay gap overall is lower in the public sector than it is in the private sector. There is overall better equalities practice. Uh, you're more likely to be able to work flexibly and your employer is more likely to have undertaken an equal pay review. But women's employment is still concentrated in a relatively small number of occupations. So again, the admin, the caring, retail jobs, whereas men are very concentrated in trades, uh, process plant and machine operatives. Where does all of this come from though? As opposed to it being an innate gender differences, we know that children are significantly influenced by a range of different factors, by the people around them, their peers, uh, nursery teachers, teachers in school, their families, and by the media, and by the opportunities that are available to them. So one example, there's an advert for a dressing up box, which includes a very exciting array of costumes for boys. Uh, we've got a pirate, a firefighter, a knight. Um, we'll not mention the red Indian, I don't think. Um, for girls, not so much opportunity there. Um, if you can tell the difference, there's a bride. There is a, which is obviously very aspirational, uh, a <laughs> bride, a princess, a model, a movie star, and my own favorite is the belle of the ball, which who wouldn't want to be that? A flippant example, but the message is quite clear. 
the, the marketing of goods and toys to children and young people is insidious and creates very entrenched gender stereotyping and norms. And the result of that is that when children go to school and young people have to make choices around subjects and careers, that is when that gender segregation begins. And we see girls and young women choosing subjects such as biology, um, art and design, languages, care, going on to do teaching, whereas men are more likely to be in studying physics, maths, computing, construction, and engineering. These gender segregated subjects have different labor market outcomes. They result in women receiving less pay overall and men receiving more pay overall. So occupational segregation is a cradle to the labor market problem. And when we think about the skills pipeline, um, in relation to STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and maths, it's often characterized as being leaky, with women detaching at various points along the pipeline, which contributes to the dearth of women in these occupations. And a particularly astounding attrition rate, so 73% of women in Scotland with STEM qualifications don't work in STEM-related jobs. Women's employment in general is becoming more precarious. It's been widely reported that the female employment rate is the highest it's ever been uh, post-recession. Uh, but women are still concentrated in low-paid jobs and sectors. They're still more likely to be in insecure and temporary work. There's more women than men on zero-hour contracts. And the number of, uh, the number of women reporting um, to be underemployed has doubled. So twice as many women are working part-time but report that they want to be working full-time hours. Public sector spending cuts impact disproportionately on women because they make up the majority of public sector employees. And we see that manifesting in, in forced reduction in hours pay and recruitment freezes, redundancies, and flex, uh, refusals of flexible working requests. Two thirds of workers earning below the living wage are women, and 40% of those women work part time. Women have less income, less access to resources, assets, and financial independence than men. They have less savings, and if we consider pensions, for example, Women are less likely to be in work, which means they're less likely to be contributing to a pension. And of those who are in work, many are in low paid work, which means they're less able to contribute to pensions. They're also more likely to have breaks in service, which again affects your income in retirement. And what that means for female pensioners, it means they're more likely to be living in poverty and they on average have lower occupational pension payments and lower state pension payments. The gender impact of so-called welfare reform is well rehearsed. Research by the House of Commons Library has found that 85% of the £26 billion worth of cuts have come from women's incomes. That's because women are twice as reliant on social security than men because of their propensity to be in low work, but also because they're, uh, they're more likely to be carers. But when we talk about work, the focus of the discussion is always very much on the paid labor market. But let's take a moment to think, what is actually work from all the different tasks that everyone does during the day? So, for example, caring for patients in a hospital, that's, that's very obviously work, right? But caring for a family member or someone that's sick at home, is that not work? Is that something else? Similarly, if you're a private sector board member and you're writing a letter as part of your role, that's work. But if you're on the board of a third sector organization and you're writing a letter in that role, is that not work? It's very similar types of work. The system of national accounts, which determines the measurements that we use for calculating economic output, suggests that when you're doing childcare, when you're tidying your house, when you're cleaning the bathroom, when you're emptying the dishwasher, that that's not work, that's leisure, which is not the sort of leisure that I would certainly want to be having. Um, mainstream economic models uh, that's dominant 
is the neoclassical approach. And that approach is based on the assumption that individuals make choices that are free from the constraints of social, cultural, and environmental influences. So in other words, women, when they choose to participate in the labor market, uh, that is free from the constraints or the structural influences, such as their disproportionate share of unpaid caring, such as a lack of flexible working, that they are choosing to participate in the labor market on an equal basis. But we know that's not the case because the labor market doesn't take account of disproportionate share of unpaid caring, of a lack of flexible working, of discrimination in workplaces. So the unpaid work that goes on in the home and the community, this isn't counted, it isn't valued and it isn't counted and it isn't accounted for in GDP. So the ONS household satellite accounts experimentally measures different types of domestic and reproductive labour and gives a value to it. And in 2010, they looked at childcare and they determined that informal childcare is worth £343 billion to the economy, equivalent to 23% of GDP. And the OECD said that one third to a half of all valuable economic activity is not counted for in traditional measures of economic performance, in other words, GDP. And it's that hidden work that enables the wider economy to function. So economists will say that there's no value to unpaid work, but there may be no cost attached to women doing it in their own homes. But if they stop doing that work, the cost to replace those services is enormous. So what the point of that is that the impact of women's unpaid work, such as their disproportionate share of unpaid caring, impacts significantly on women's ability to participate and progress in the labour market on an equal basis with men. When we take into account domestic labour, childcare, care for adults, the emotional labour, all of these are done mainly by women, whereas men most of their time is taken up with the formal labour market, but we don't value the different types of labour that women do. Why does all of this matter? It matters because what is women's work isn't valued and it isn't counted. Occupational segregation restricts women's and men's choices and girls and boys because it means that not everyone is doing what they want to do. The gender pay gap, most obviously, is an impact, impacts women's incomes, which contributes to women's higher levels of poverty and therefore child poverty. We know that when women's incomes reduced, that spending on children goes down. And lower incomes for women also affects local economies because women are more likely to be spending in their local areas. Female pensioner poverty, higher levels there. But it's not just women and their families that are affected. Employers are missing out because on women's skills and talents because so many women are in the wrong jobs for their skill level, and that's a great waste. Going back to traditional measures of um, economic output, occupational segregation is a market failure. Uh, it contributes to this underutilization of women's skills, contributes to skills shortages. The sectors which have the higher skills shortages, it's no coincidence that those are the ones that are most acutely segregated. So looking at STEM industries, for example. But occupational segregation is a labor market failure. It's what economists call allocative inefficiency because the market is failing to allocate workers to the correct jobs and training places based on their skill level. And the effect of that is high. The drag on economic growth is worth more than 17 billion to Scotland's economy, equivalent of 12% of GDP. So reducing occupational segregation, closing the pay gap and advancing women's equality is good not just for individual women and their families, but it's good for employers and it's good for the wider Scottish economy. Thank you.